This is episode six with Tim Schmidt. Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is Self Made Man, the podcast for men who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of their lives. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Self Made Man podcast. My name is Mike Dillard, and today we are going to have a fascinating discussion about a fairly controversial topic, which is a man's duty when it comes to protecting his family and his loved ones. You know, in the past, that was accomplished probably on a daily basis with spears and rocks, but today it's done with firearms. So I have invited a very good friend of mine to join us, Mr. Tim Schmidt, who is the CEO and founder of the U.S. Concealed Carry Association. And ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go deep today. For example, if a man does not have the ability to protect his family, is he, by definition, still a man? Question one. Question two. If another man imposes his will through laws that take away your ability to defend your family and yourself, are you still free? Or at that point, are you actually a slave? So fasten your seatbelts. This is going to be an absolutely fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for being here. And with that being said, here is Tim Schmidt. All right, here we are with Mr. Tim Schmidt from the U.S. Concealed Carry Association. Tim, how are you doing, brother? Hello, Mike. I'm doing fantastic. I'm very excited excited to be a part of Self Made Man. Yeah, well, I'm I'm super grateful that you're you're here as well because we're going to be talking about a topic that is obviously going to be a bit controversial. Probably not so much for for my for my audience, but. It's a serious topic, and it's definitely going to get some feathers ruffled. But my my hope and my goal for our time together here today is that this is going to provide people with a lot of serious things to think about that have to do with their own personal safety, their family safety, but from a philosophical standpoint as well when it comes to freedom and, and the concept and idea of being a self made man. And uh, I couldn't think of a better person to bring on uh, than you, Tim. And you know we've known each other for about 10 years now. And you know, we've had we we're, we're getting old quickly my friend, but I think it's that's been about how long since uh, since we we met in Yonics mastermind group years ago. Wow, has it really been 10 years? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting there. So, Tim, if you could, I wanted to see if you could start by giving people a little information about your story and then we're going to kind of dive into how you know, you came into the, the business and the industry that you're in now, but I'd love to just give people a little bit of info about who you are, what you're about, and uh, whatever else you'd like to share. Yeah, no problem, Mike. Um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you kind of a quasi-abbreviated version of the story, and uh, if we want to dig deeper into certain parts, we can do that. So, you know, I kind of started my professional career. I went to study to be an engineer, and why did I study to be an engineer? Because in general, I, I didn't like to talk to people, <laughs> <laughs> and it's a fact of the matter, and um so I studied to be an engineer, was an engineer at a company, you know, the typical uh, job, if you will. But shortly thereafter, I realized that, you know what, I, I actually do have the entrepreneurial uh, blood in my, in, in my body. And, uh, and so only two years out of college, I started my first business. And it was an engineering, a mechanical engineering consulting firm. And I thought long and hard about the name of it. And I called it Schmidt Engineering. <laughs> <laughs> And you know what, Mike? You know that was a it was a successful business. You now I started in 1997, and um, that business allowed my wife to uh, allowed my wife to stay home, and we, we were serious about starting a family. And um, but I'll tell you one thing: it certainly uh, you know it, it was essentially just a glorified job because because I you know it was we were either really busy or or really slow. You know it was it was not a lifestyle business at all. And and really, so you know, in, ter- in terms of the story that you probably really want to hear, that all changed uh, when my first son was born. So Tim Jr. was born, and obviously about 16 years ago, he's 16 years of, of age. And at the time, I was knee deep in the in the engineering business, um, just slogging it out, trying to you know make make uh, make a living. And when when my son was born, Mike, I, I really went through my own personal, uh, I guess what I call my own personal self defense awakening. You know, really never in my life had I realized that, you know, holy cow, you know, this new baby in my arms, um, in addition to my wife, you know, it's my responsibility to protect and, and defend these people. And so, you know, just like every engineer would do, I, I, I'm like, I need to do some research. You know what? 
I've, I've got to improve the tools that I have available to me to, to be able to protect and defend because right now I don't think I can. And so that's exactly what I did, Mike. I, I bought every book and subscribed to every magazine and went on the Internet and just studied everything there was about, you know, carrying a gun and self-defense and, and you know, what it actually takes to, to responsibly do that. And did, did anyone in your, in your house have, have that same mindset? Did your, did your dad a- approach that the same way when you were growing up? Um, he did. I mean, Mike, he did. When we had guns in my house growing up and they really weren't for hunting, they're, they're for self-defense. Now, you know, it's one thing to have guns in your house for self-defense. And, you know, certainly my dad, he would explain to us that, Hey, these are, these are the guns, you know, you have to respect them. And, you know, and he did that. So, you know, the, 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 I had the foundations there, but it's a big step to go from growing up in a household with firearms and then making the decision that, yes, I need to carry a gun to defend my loved ones, you know, when, when that time comes. And so, you know, and so you're right, you know, I did have that foundation and, you know, I, I went through that process of kind of, like I said before, self-discovery and then the entrepreneurial gene kind of kicked in. I thought, you know what, this is crazy. You know, what if I were to create this resource and, 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 and help other people like me to go down that path of, of self-defense discovery and awareness and, and teach them, you know, Hey, here's how you can, put yourself in a situation where, where you can be the protector and defender of your loved ones and you don't have to rely on the police. And, and so there I was like in 2000 and I guess it would have been early, you know, some, somewhere in the first couple of years of, 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 of 2000, maybe 2002 was when I, I, I hatched the idea, Hey, I, I know what I'll do. I'll start a magazine. <laughs> now, now to any of you who are listening, who've started a magazine, you know that that's probably one of the worst business ideas to start you know, next, <laughs> next to maybe starting a restaurant. <laughs> right. Well, well I, I heard this inter- internet thing is out there, but I don't think that's going to go anywhere. So let's do a magazine. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know, I'll be the first to tell you that, you know, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I just, I just don't give up. <laughs> and, and so that, but that's exactly what I did. I, I launched this magazine. I went Went and I ordered uh, three books from Amazon, How to Start a Magazine. And um, lucky for me, I didn't read any of them because had I read them, I never would have done it. Because they all, they all, 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 all three of the books recommended, you know, don't do this. This is never, <laughs> never going to work. It has, it has one page. It says, don't do this. <laughs> see, <laughs> see page one. <laughs> yeah. and, so, and so this brainchild was, I, I entitled it Concealed Carry Magazine. And I thought it was brilliant. And, and well, you know, I, I launched it. You know, at the time, I was, it, was, it was so exciting. I, I, I literally more, I, I, I took out all the money that I had in terms of home equity and, and bought this list of 30,000, you know, direct mail people. And I had 30,000 copies of the magazine printed. And mm-hmm. you know, I, put, I, I put it all on, on one color on the roulette wheel. And out of that, I got 1,000 subscribers. But now I was in a situation, Mike, where I had spent six months you know, at night putting this first issue of the magazine together. And now I had a thousand people expecting another magazine in like six weeks. Right. So needless to say, I had no idea what to do. And, and uh, that was just the beginning of the headaches. From there, I spent two years just, you know, well, luckily the engineering business was still going on. It was, so it kind of acted as a sugar daddy <laughs> for mm-hmm. this magazine, obviously paying for all the bills. Yeah. So that was, that was kind of the beginning. That, that's how I got into this whole thing. So, you know, we've got a ton of entrepreneurs who are going to be hearing this. And, and while this isn't the, you know, business isn't the topic of today's discussion, you know, let's go ahead and end that, that little story about your business with, you know, what you've accomplished since then, because obviously it has become a, a huge success, a very successful business. And if you wouldn't mind sharing just a couple of the numbers that you have, maybe the number of readers or subscribers or whatever, whatever you're comfortable sharing, I'm sure people would love to, to hear, you know, the, how the, how the story ends. Of course, of course. Yeah. So, so. You know, so there we were in, in 2004, you know, 10 years ago with, like I said, you know, we started with a thousand subscribers I didn't even have an email list at the time. And, you know, the first couple of years are rough and, and really the turning point, I'll, I'll tell you about the turning point before I give you some of the, the, the fun numbers. You know, the turning point for me, Mike, was when I decided to, to get serious about studying old school direct response marketing. And, you know, there are a few, uh, there, there were, I had various mentors Along the way, you know, certainly that, you know, that's how I met you. You and I were in a, a, essentially a direct response marketing mastermind group. And, and that's what really helped me transform the business from, you know, sucking the money out of my engineering company to, to actually a viable, successful business that, that uh, which, you know, essentially enabled me to, to sell the engineering business. So, so just 
you know, flashback 2004, 1,000 subscribers to the magazine, hadn't even come up with the concept of the association yet, to today we have, so we put out a weekly email newsletter, and that goes to 1.4 million people. Our magazine is read by 120,000 subscribers, and we have 75,000 uh, members of our association. Ten years, you know, you know, certainly we've got a long ways to go, but, but that's what happened in the first ten years. Wow, that's awesome. That's a that's that's amazing, and and uh, I assume this is your your baby for the next you know uh, the next ten, and it's just gonna gonna grow bigger and bigger, especially with the climate that we have here uh, in the United States, which we're obviously going to be talking about here today uh, in just a minute. So exactly, Mike. I mean, this is you know I tell people you know I, I loved. I'm so glad I studied engineering. I think engineering teaches you how to solve problems, teaches you how to think. But I I am convinced that I was born. I was put here on this earth. To, to run this business and to, and to teach people how to effectively protect and defend their loved ones. And I'm, I feel so blessed to be in this situation to be able to do this because uh, it's, it's just fantastic. Very good. Very good. So let's dive into, you know, the, the world of, of guns and the Second Amendment and the discussions that are going on here today. You know, one of the, one of the things I, I still have never forgotten, Tim, you had it on your website years ago. This is probably five or six years ago, but it was... It, it was essentially a you know sales copy to to share your your membership, but for me it was also a bit of a history lesson uh, when it comes to you know the reason why owning a firearm is you know not not just you know what might be a prudent idea for your own safety and the safety of your family, but a, a much bigger, broader, and more important issue on a philosophical level when it comes to the protection of, you know, uh, a free society. And I wanted to see if we could really start there. You know, why is it for a free country uh, to be able to, to arm its citizens and for citizens to have the ability to, to defend themselves with a firearm? That's a great place to start, Mike. And like you said before, to some people, this may sound a little bit controversial, but, you know, hey, if you read your history books and if you read the, the words of the founding fathers of the United States, uh, there's absolutely no controversy in this at all. And that is that, it, you know, a, a free people must have the ability to defend themselves. Now, when our founding fathers talked about that, they weren't talking about defending themselves from bad guys or criminals or burglars. They were talking about be, the ability of a free people to defend themselves against a tyrannical government. Now, why were they saying that? Because they just got done defending themselves against Great Britain, obviously a tyranny. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if a person is listening to this, <laughs> it's pretty important that, that they buy into this fundamental natural born right of self-protection and, and the fact that by definition, a free people must be able to defend themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And most people don't understand that, especially here in, you know, modern day America, because, you know, for all intents and purposes, the government is trying to, to squash the very notion of that idea and, and that that is the reason that the Second Amendment exists. So, you know, first and foremost, I've personally agree that that's really what this is about here. This is not only a personal issue, but it's a national, you know, uh, freedom issue. And, uh, if we lose the Second Amendment and if we don't practice, you know, the, the right that we have in that regard and, and that goes away, then there is no ability for us as citizens to stand up to the government when they decide to take the First Amendment away and, you know, all of the rest of them. And that's really what it's designed to be is a, a safety and a, a security issue for the American people against, you know, abuses of the government. So that in and of itself is the biggest issue and the most important. And, you know, it's interesting I did not grow up in a household with firearms. In fact, I believe I am the first member of my known family tree, at least back to my great-grandparents, or my grandparents at least. I'm the first person to actually own a firearm, and that did not happen until about 2007, 2008. Wow. And the inspiration for me to actually go out and, and buy one and shoot one for the first time was you know, what I knew about the financial crisis that we were going through uh, there at that time and what it potentially could have been uh, you know, within just a couple of days of, of going over the precipice and into the, the, the pit there and the chaos that could have come from that. Uh, you know, that was really the inspiration for me where 
I, I finally, you know, went over to the gun store and, and picked up my first Glock. And I believe I called you before I did so and asked you for some advice on what to pick up. And we're actually going to talk about that here a little bit later in the podcast. Mike, I remember, I remember that call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was great. <laughs> I, I, and I still, I still have that, that particular pistol, uh, among many more then, but you know, there's obviously an element of, of fear and the unknown, uh, when it comes to shooting a gun for the first time. Uh, but I found that once you actually go do it, it really truly goes away very quickly and you become very comfortable, very fast. And, at that point, you realize that, you know, this isn't about something scary or the big bad wolf. It really is just a tool uh, that can you can use for a particular job, and hopefully you will never need it. But if you do, it's an extremely important one to have. So, you know, when it comes to men in general, I really feel that guys have a obligation to be able to protect their families. And when you look at the world today, it really is quite amazing to think about that this is the first period in history where it is uncommon or not the norm for men specifically to walk around on a daily basis without some form of protection at their side. You know, when you've got the cavemen, you know, days and whatever it may be, you've got your spear and your rocks and whatever it may be in the, in the old West here in the United States, you had your revolver. But at every period through society, it was normal and expected for you to have a firearm uh, when they existed or, or a knife or the ability to defend yourself. And if you didn't, it meant that you were a slave. That was really the only category of people who didn't have, you know, that ability uh, or that right. So to me, it's no different today if you go to, to England, which I was just there, uh, you know, recently. And you obviously cannot own a firearm in, in the U.K., for me, you're just a, a, an animal in a cage at that point, and you've lost the ability to, to defend yourself. And let's say the government wants to come in and take away your property or uh, abuse your family, or if you were you know, a Jew in Nazi Germany and they come up and show, it your, show up at your door and start you know, taking your wife and kids and throwing them on a train, and you don't own a firearm and you have no ability to defend yourself, what are you at that point? And that, uh, to me, is at the heart of this conversation, which really changed my view and my outlook on this to where it's not about the gun. It's about the ability to call yourself a free man. And the ability to own a gun is the primary sign that you are one. And I wanted to see if you could share your thoughts on that. Oh, Mike, I mean, everything you just said the last couple of minutes is, is right on right on the money. One of my favorite quotes from Benjamin Franklin, he says, Ben, ben says, those who surrender freedom for security will not have, nor do they deserve either one. And so you talk about, you know, this, this is the first time in, in society where it's uncommon for, for a man or anyone to walk around without a legitimate way of self-protection. And, and, and ultimately, you know, I, I feel that essentially what, what people are doing is they're, they're, they're trading in their freedoms for this perception of security. And, and that's what, what Franklin was alluding to, the fact that, that if, if you, you think you're trading in your freedoms for security, but guess what? You're not, you're not getting security at all. You're getting the illusion of security. You know, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in, in that it's a social responsibility for everyone, for every man, to be able to, and, and be willing to, to protect and defend their loved ones. My, my dad, one of his favorite sayings growing up, and, and you know, he said to me so often, I would just get sick of hearing it. He's like, Tim... If it is to be, it's up to me. You know, so essentially that's the way of him, him saying is that, hey, if you want something to happen, you have to take responsibility for it. And, and you know, you're talking before, Mike, about, about people having an irrational fear of, the, of, of, of firearms. Well, guess what? I mean, in general, people have irrational fears of, of anything that's unknown. You know, one, one of my favorite things to do, Mike, is, is if I'll meet someone that, that, you know, and this happens all the time, I meet someone that has this irrational fear of of firearms or even the concept of self-defense, you know, if they're willing, my number one methodology for getting them to see the other side is to take them to the range and take them shooting. And, and you know, once this person realizes that, okay, wow, you know, this gun, like you said before, it, it is just a tool. It's a tool that I am in complete control of. However, it does give me immense, uh, I want to say immense power, but it certainly is the ultimate equalizer. And so if I ever have the opportunity of of, of trying to con convert someone to at least being open to the concept that it's reasonable to, to be willing to, to protect and defend your loved ones, I'll always take them to the range. 
And so I guess maybe the last thing I'll say about this is that, you know, I, I personally think that, that, that this shift, I guess, in society away from, from men being willing to stand up and, and have the ability to protect and defend their loved ones is just this onslaught of, of progressivism and, and a shift towards, for, towards central power. And, and ultimately, that it's kind of like an entropic situation where, you know, left to, it, left to their own devices, you know, society will, will just kind of tend to give away their freedom unless they're cognizantly fighting for it. And, and so that's why, you know, this perception of, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll just trust the police. They'll take care of me. They'll protect me because I'm not willing to stand up and protect myself. Well, if you ask me, that's, that's the beginning of the end. I couldn't agree more. It's been amazing, amazing to watch the the transition of American society specifically over the last, I'd say, four to six years, it has been unbelievable to see what is being taught in our public schools these days, to see the values that have not only eroded, but then completely shifted, you know, in, in our education system, where they're now calling the founding fathers terrorists and in school books and police meetings and and things like that. So that was actually the inspiration for this podcast and why I started the Self Made Man podcast because I wanted to reintroduce the value systems that allowed Americans to become great in the first place and that built this nation. Uh, because we are we are quickly quickly uh, falling down a very dangerous slope. So you know that's why I think what you're doing and and what U.S. Concealed Carry is doing and promoting is so important and why. My goal is to get people to really think, you know, in a very deep manner uh, about what this is really about. And it's not about the gun. It's, it's about the, what, really what the gun represents, which is your ability to defend yourself and freedom. So, you know, Tim, one of the questions that you were just hitting upon, which is, you know, that, that entropy or that momentum. And I, I'm sitting here asking myself, why are people seemingly moving in that direction? Because from a very common sense, rational standpoint, it makes no sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. And is this, you know, is this simply, you know, brainwashing from a, a media basis daily, you know, over the course of years? And people are just being reprogrammed to pursue, you know, actions that are, are going to cause them harm down the road and, and harm for their children? Or what, what is your thought on that? Yeah, Mike. I mean, I, I would say that that um, the best single explanation would be that it is a, um, I guess, a coordinated effort by our education system, which unfortunately, in, in, the, in the most of the education, at least the the uh, undergraduate education that goes on in the United States, is sponsored by what? Sponsored by the government, and and so therefore, you know the. Our, our children are taught in schools that that, that guns are bad and they're and, and only bad guys have guns. In the past, you know, parents, you know, they would take the responsibility to, to you know to counteract that teaching. And unfortunately, I feel that 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 work, that's kind of slipping as well. You know, certainly in in the in the more you know, on the east and the west coast, it's, it's it's a lot worse than it is in the Midwest or or certainly down south. But I mean, I, I think those are the two sources. I mean, it, it all it all comes from the younger generation, and when the younger generation grows up thinking that that the only people that the only people that have guns are the bad guys and the cops, well, guess what? That's what that's what the reality is going to become. Yeah, it's it's unbelievably concerning. You know, one of the highest highest aspirations that I have, and that I think anyone you know any any man could have at least is. You know, once you make a decision to protect yourself and protect your family and acquire that skill set, which is really, you know, what this comes down to, at the end of the day, the gun's not going to save you. It's your ability to use it effectively and safely and, and responsibly that counts. So maybe we can talk about, well, in fact, we will talk about that here in a little bit. It's one of the, the last questions that I have for you. But before we get there, one of the highest aspirations that I have, you know, once you've passed through that, that threshold and comfort zone and acquired that skill set is to really act and become a civilian sheepdog. And I wanted to see if you could tell everybody what that means, what that stands for and, and what that looks like. Sure, sure. That's, uh, so the whole sheepdog concept, I'm not sure if it was invented, but certainly it was heavily promoted by a good friend of mine, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. And he, he came up with the concept, I believe it, he wrote it in an essay, I, I think it was just called The American Sheepdog. And he likened it to the story where you know, in general, most of the population are, are sheep. And, you know, if, if you and I think about, th think, think throughout our regular day and, and you, you envision people walking down, 
walking downtown with their with their uh, heads in their looking at their their texting while they're walking, completely oblivious to their surroundings and, and just kind of going with the flow and, and not, not even paying attention. We refer to these people as sheep. They just kind of do as they're told. And of course, on the on the flip side of that, you have wolves, right? The wolves are the guys who are looking for the sheep, and and you know they're the they're the, the sociopaths in our society who are no matter what happens, no matter what we do with them, they're going to be the criminals, okay? And then there's a small segment of society which which Lieutenant Colonel Grossman refers to as the sheepdogs, and of course, the sheepdogs are the people. They're the ones who, who, who are actually always aware. They, they're cognizant of, of their surroundings, and they've made the decision to live that lifestyle of that responsibly armed American and that person that's willing to protect the sheep because they're going to need the protection. Now, a lot of sheepdogs you know, decide to, to go into the military, or maybe they, go into, uh, they become police officers because it's just their natural desire to protect. Um, but a lot of sheepdogs are just you know, regular moms and dads and, and, and fathers like you and I are, Mike. And so that's the that's the whole sheepdog thing. It's one of my favorite essays. I highly recommend that uh, that the listeners here check check out Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. Fantastic guy. A lot to learn from him. Cool. I'll put a link to that if it's obviously available on his website here in the show notes, and everybody can check that out. I'm sure it's amazing. So yeah, absolutely. Not only you know do you make the evolution from protecting yourself, protecting your family, then to protecting you know your fellow citizens around you, which is obviously one of the highest levels of of service that you can obtain. So, Tim, let's say that, you know, someone's curiosity is peaked around this and they say, you know what, you know, this this is important not only to myself, but to protecting the freedom, uh, you know, the freedoms that we have here in the United States. What would be your progression on on how they go ahead and, and get started in, you know, becoming a gun owner and learning the skill sets they need to use it effectively and what kind of classes they should take? What should they, you know, how should they learn? How should they train? What would you recommend? Oh boy, boy, Mike, that that's a question we could be talking about for the next seven hours. <laughs> I'll, I'll try. I'll try to give you the abbreviated version. So the the ideal scenario, I guess, the fir- first thing it's important to understand that you know the becoming a responsibly armed citizen or becoming a sheepdog, if you will, isn't something that you just do once and then you're done and you're and then you're that person. Rather, it's it's um I like to refer to it as. I mean, it's, it's a lifestyle adjustment. It's, it's something that you do every day that you do on a regular basis. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of acting. It's a way of training. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. But it's not nearly as difficult as most people think. And, and the rewards are, are, are so overwhelming, not just in terms of, of your, obviously, your inc- the, the increased safety of your, of your family and loved ones, but just in your increased confidence and, and your increased um, you just become a better person. I'll start by saying that the ideal situation, the ideal way to really learn about this and to, and to dive in is to find a friend or loved one or person that you trust that's willing to share with you. You know, Mike, you talked before about when you called me and asked for some, some tips on buying that first gun. I mean, that's exactly what you did, you know, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that that's really the best way. It, it, it works the best, especially if you can find someone that's willing to take you to the range and, and be patient with you and, and, and kind of teach you from their perspective. You know, the, the firearms and self-defense world is littered, if you will, <laughs> with, with what I sometimes refer to as mall ninjas. <laughs> and and I mean, there's just a lot of people that have a lot of strong opinions. And sometimes it's very difficult to kind of to, to weave your way in and out of, of, okay, what's opinion, what's fact, and what's maybe a combination of the two. So, Number one, ideal situation is to find someone that you trust that can take you down this path. Number two, and I, you know, I, I don't want to sound too self-promoting here, but, but the USCCA website has, and I'm not sure if most people know this, but we used to have all of our content articles behind a wall. You'd have to be a member to join, but now everything's open. So, so you can, there's literally thousands of professionally written research articles that that, that we have available for free on our website, uscca.com, where people can learn about every possible aspect of, of living that armed lifestyle. So that, that would be the, probably the second place I'd go. I mean, are there other website resources? Of course there are, but those would be my first two. Awesome. And, you know, going a, going a step further, what would you, and you know, straight up, you know, give, give your opinion on this one. You know, what, 
what would you start with, you know, from a firearm standpoint? Obviously, there's a ton of debate about, you know, which, which brand is better, which caliber is better, all of those things. If you could give people a real quick, you know, kind of one-on-one primer on handgun ownership uh, specifically, and then we can kind of dive into some other options for home defense, such as shotguns and things like that. Sure. Um, yeah, but let's start with kind of a one-on-one for, for handgun ownership. Okay, so my, my first, my first um, I guess, question, let's say that I was having this conversation with this person, would be, okay, what do you want, what do you want the handgun for? Do you, do you want to carry it as a self-defense weapon, or are you thinking that you're going to have this in your house? Now, if they say, well, hey, I'm going to carry the, I'm going to carry the gun with me every day, that's my intention. Well, then my first recommendation would be that you need to carry a gun that is comfortable in your hand and that you can conceal in a relatively comfortable fashion. Because guess what? If you if you follow the advice of your uncle Harry or or Aunt June, right? They have their own favorite handguns. And number one, maybe it doesn't fit your hand. Or number two, maybe it doesn't fit your type of body style. Well, then guess what? You're never going to carry that handgun. And therefore, if you're never going to carry it, it's never going to be there when you need it. So my first recommendation is to is to go do a gun shop and and just ask the guy, the counter guy, just hold a bunch of guns and, and feel the ones that are comfortable. So that that would be from a handgun perspective. Now, if the person said, "Well, hey, I just want to, I just want to care, I just want this gun to be, you know, in my in a safe on my nightstand if in case something happens at night," well, it, it, it's actually similar advice in the sense that 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 you know the gun has to be comfortable comfortable in your hand. You have to be able to confidently shoot it. But of course, the the concealment aspect isn't nearly as poor, important because you're not going to carry the gun. Um, in terms of specific brands, I would I would definitely recommend staying with you know the top. What five to ten main brands like you know Smith and Wesson, uh, Springfield Armory, uh, Sig Sauer, uh, Glock, Remington, Ruger. You know the, the the kind of the common brands that you hear about. Now there's there's new handgun companies coming out every single year, and um, I got to be honest with you. You know some of these handgun companies turn into legitimate companies, but there's been a lot of times when you know we'll get a sample gun here at USCCA to to fire with and. There's no there's no history with them and and uh, you know half the time the darn guns you know they'll work for about a half of a day and then something will bust on them so I, I highly recommend you know spending an extra fifty to hundred dollars to get that name brand name brand uh, good handgun personally if you're asking my personal opinion you can't go wrong with Glock yes they're Austrian so if you know if you got to hang up with American made guns well then you're gonna have to go with Smith and Wesson but you know Glock does have a factory in Georgia so. So I'm, you know, the 99.9% chance that your your Glock will, will be made in Georgia. Um, I've got a ton of Glocks. I've taken, I've, I've beaten the crap out of my Glocks, Mike, and um, they always work. <laughs> yeah, agreed. And that's what you recommended for me, you know, years ago when when I started down this path. And that was the very first gun that I bought, which was a Glock 21, which is a, huh. a kind of a full size 45 caliber. That's and, an understatement. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a that's a big that's a big weapon and. Uh, definitely not for concealed carry use for me. That was, uh, you know, that was really home defense and, you know, it's I don't, it, one of the first things that I'd suggest you guys do if you haven't had this opportunity yet is, you know, when you get to the gun shop, ask the, ask the salesman to pull out a, a nine millimeter and a 45 round and you will marvel at the difference. Um, not necessarily, and we'll talk about this here in a second, uh, that, that bigger is better, but it's a substantial round. Uh, needless to say, needless to say, Tim, I have since switched over to nine millimeters for everything, but I have stuck with the Glock. So, you know, these days I, I keep a, a Glock 19 just about everywhere. I think I have four or five of them actually. And that way everything is standard, same magazines for everything, same rounds for everything. And it, and it, it basically becomes a systematized, you know, uh, a system where I can keep them in an emergency bag or throughout the house or whatever it may be. And, uh, so, you know, that was the first recommendation that you've made. And, and I, I couldn't agree with you more on Glocks for, for me personally, I just don't see any reason to buy, any other brand, uh, you know, I've got a, I've got a Smith and Wesson as well. I just, I'm so used to Glocks that that's what I'm used to these days and, and what I stick with. And at the end of the day, the question that you posed to me or the the suggestion that you had is, you know, all, the only one thing counts when it comes to the gun you buy, Mike, which is will it fire the moment you pull the trigger, you know, at that moment of need. And your your highest chances of that being a yes are with a Glock, you know, historically uh, from a reliability standpoint. So that's why. You know, moving on from a, a home defense perspective, 
the other first non-handgun I bought was a Mossberg, I think it's a 390 shotgun. Does that sound right? Sure, that sounds right. Yeah, the model number, which is a pump action 12 gauge. And, uh, you know, you can pick one of those up for, I think, about 300 bucks. The Glocks, you're looking at about four or $500. You know, but pump action, you know, shotgun for, for home defense with birdshot. What are your, what are your comments on that? What do you use at your house for, for home defense? Yeah, I couldn't agree more in terms of the shotgun. Um, personally, I have, I have uh, 12 gauge shotguns in my house for, for home defense. I prefer the, the, the Benelli. Have a, have an, have an M4 myself. I've moved, <laughs> moved upward and onward from the pump action. Uh, yeah, but yeah, if you could explain, I, I assume you have an M4. Yes, correct. Yeah. Why don't you explain the difference uh, for folks between a pump action and a, and a semi-auto? Yep. So, so you know, the pump action shotgun. I guess if I could, you know, for those of you who aren't all that familiar with firearms, I'll kind of use like your typical movie reference. When you see someone with a shotgun in a movie, and you see them kind of, you know, they're they're holding the shot the the, the butt end with their shoulder, and then their their left hand, if they're right-handed, is grabbing the underside, and they and they yank it down, and it makes that really cool <laughs> racking of the of the shotgun noise, that's a pump action shotgun. So every time that you want to chamber a new round, you have to pull that down and, and it chambers around. Whereas a semi-automatic shotgun, like the, the Benelli that we're talking about, um, I'm sorry, the, uh, what are we talking about? Benelli yeah, or Benelli M4. Oh, the Benelli M4. It, it, it's, uh, it, the, the, the recoil, uh, the energy of the recoil loads the next round in the chamber. So you just pull the trigger and then the the action cycles, and it and it loads the next round in the chamber. So all you, you don't have to worry about cycling. You just press, you know, pull the trigger. So as fast as you can pull the trigger, it's putting it's putting lead down range, which with a Benelli M4 is unbelievably <laughs> impressive. Pretty fast, yeah. It's unbelievable, and that you know that's really the Rolls Royce of combat shotguns or self defense shotguns, if you will, and those those run about twenty two hundred bucks, I believe, if memory serves me collect- correctly. But really, there's no other there's no other shotgun out there that you know that goes above and beyond that, and it's been it's been an amazing weapon to own. So we've talked a little bit about pistols. We've talked a little bit about shotguns right now. You know, what kind of rounds would you recommend specifically for home defense? Because you know, one of the things that you need to consider is where you live. If you live in an apartment complex, you have to you have to remember that you're only separated by your your neighbors living next to you by some sheetrock. And that doesn't stop bullets very well at all. So one of the the biggest concerns that you have, especially living in, you know, again, a, a community is what happens if you have to pull the trigger? You know, what's what's behind the path of that bullet or along it? And can it penetrate into somebody else's home, whether that's, you know, through your wall or across the hallway or, you know, through your ceiling, uh, you know, out your window across the street? And Tim, what would you, you know, what would your, your suggestions be as far as how to minimize that risk? Uh, th- th- those are great points, Mike. Um, so, so like you said before, you know, you really have to be cognizant of, of where you live. So for example, you know, if you're living in, in an apartment complex, I, I would highly recommend, you know, essentially birdshot, which is, you know, very, very tiny little pellets and you're not going to have, or you're going to have a significantly smaller over penetration problem. Now, of course, the downside of that is that you know, you're not going to be able to transfer as much energy to, to the bad guy if he's if he's coming in your apartment. However, you know, getting getting shot at close range with with a you know a 16 or 12 gauge bird shot is you know is, is going to be very uncomfortable. Um, now, say for example, in my situation, I live in a kind of a, a small town and way out on the edge of town in a subdivision, and so I don't have to worry about my neighbors at all. The only thing I have to worry about are the uh, you know essentially my kids' bedrooms. Now, all my kids' bedrooms are upstairs. And so I, I, in my shotgun, I keep it loaded with um, double odd buckshot. So now, double odd buckshot, the size of the pellets, instead of like almost like like tiny little BBs, they're actually approximately about you know three hundred thousandths of a, in, in diameter. So that's like you know larger than a quarter of an inch. These are like little tiny marbles, and uh, when those hit the bad guy, you know they're it's going to take off giant chunks, if you will. <laughs> and uh, now, of course, the, you know, you have to be a little more careful, you know, and, but, but in my situation, you know, I, I know exactly where all the kids are and, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a reasonable risk from, from my perspective. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I use, I use just self-defense rounds. I don't know if they're from Remington. I don't remember who they are, but uh, you know, it, it is made for that specific, you know, function. Thankfully I've never had to use it, but it will do the job should I ever need to. 
And then we, we, you know, finally brings us to one more class or category of weapon here, which is the, uh, the assault rifle, which is the, the media's favorite <laughs> uh, whipping boy. And that is typically, you know, most commonly an AR-15, which is a, a variant of the M-16 or the, the next generation of the M-16 that, we, you know, was made popular back in Vietnam. It's a much more reliable weapon these days. But it's the kind of, uh, you know, rifle that the military uses, and it, it holds a 30-round magazine, which has also come under attack here recently and in, in the past couple of years. And, Tim, is there any reason or scenario that someone would own that specifically in a, in a self-defense type of role? I, <laughs> of course, of course, Mike. Uh, so, so one of the things I'll just mention is you're right. You know, the, the assault rifle has, has become like the darling of the media in terms of, you know, they've, they've, they've named this weapon to, to, I guess, kind of like support their agenda. Why would anybody want an assault, ri- assault rifle? Now, of course, the, the, the firearms community has responded by saying, no, it's not an assault rifle. It's a modern sporting rifle. And so now you can see how just this war of words is, is, you know, comes into play here. I personally think the whole thing is dip, di- uh, ridiculous. Um, you know, hey, if, if, if I want to own a gun, the only reason I, sh- I should have is because I want to, right? All right, so moving, <laughs> moving on to the battle rifle or whatever we're going to call the thing. I think the, the, the perfect scenario where you'd ever want to own a rifle like that would be in a situation of um, social unrest, right? You know, you, talk, you mentioned before about, you know, you know, some situations that, that our country is, is really kind of still kind of in, in in terms of what happens. I mean, we, we saw in Wisconsin what, what happened. What the, the teachers rioted at our Capitol building for a week when, when they were asked to pay 10% of their medical uh, insurance. You know, imagine what the, the good citizens of, of, of downtown Chicago are going to do when, you know, or even Detroit, that's maybe a more appropriate example, when their city goes bankrupt and the welfare checks stop coming, right? I mean, there could be I mean, uh, bad riot situations. And having a rifle like this essentially allows you to defend your family at a long distance, right? So a handgun, handgun is, is pretty much useless past 25, you know, 50 yards if you're lucky. Whereas a rifle like this will allow you to defend your family from a long distance. Two main choices from my perspective, there's the choice you just talked about, the AR-15, which of course is a civilian version of the M16. That shoots a 5.56 millimeter, and that's the diameter of the projectile. And then of course, there's um, a little bit larger version called the, um, there's, there's a few, like the M14, which is the, uh, that was the rifle that was, that was popular right before the M16 in the Vietnam War era, and that shoots a 7.62 millimeter diameter projectile, a little, a little bit larger of a, of a rifle. But that's kind of my perspective on that. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And I own, I own quite a few uh, of both, uh, specifically AR-15s, to, to the point now where I'm like, what, are, what am I doing with all of these? You know, I, I think it's important for everyone to own each category of weapons. Specifically, when it comes down to an AR-15, it's not the best choice when it comes to home defense, obviously. But for me, it's about principle uh, more than anything else that you know, the government sees that as a, or uses that as a symbol of, you know, really their, their tyranny because they want to get rid of it where I see that as a symbol of freedom, uh, because that is, that is the weapon that people use to wage wars. And, you know, if you're going to effectively defend yourself against anyone, you would need to, you know, specifically a government of, of any kind. And, you know, if people like Mike, that's crazy talk. What are you talking about? This is the United States of America. I'm, well, it, <laughs> it's happened in just about every other country on the planet throughout their history. And, you know, when that kind of upheaval happens, uh, you know, typically one thing, one of two things happens, the citizens who are armed win, and the bad guys go away, or the people who are not armed uh, die, <laughs> exactly. know, as in China or uh, any of the other examples that you would like to give where, where despots and, and tyrannical leaders have decided that it's much easier, faster, and, and more efficient to just kill off the citizens who <laughs> are, are not fans of their rule than to, than to actually change and, and uh, you know, change their path. So... For me, that's really what it's about. And, you know, Tim, have you ever had to use your, your weapons at all throughout your history? Have you ever had any close calls where, you know, you were glad that you had, you know, your pistol on you uh, or any other of your family members or, or close friends? You know, I've, n- I've never had to draw my gun in self-defense. One time I was down in downtown Milwaukee with my entire family 
And um, we were walking down the street. And so I hear, you know, at the time I had, it was my wife, my, my two sons and my daughter. And so, you know, I'm feeling vulnerable because it's my responsibility to protect all these people. And there were some, I mean, well, Milwaukee is a, it's a beautiful town, but there are some rough parts and we were kind of on the edge of one. And, and there were, there were three men that were kind of eyeing us up. Didn't have to draw my gun, but I'm convinced that the fact that I was carrying a gun, somehow they could sense it. And I don't know if it was just the way that I looked at him or the way I was walking. Your body, but the body language for sure. The, yeah, the body language. And, and they backed off and they just, they, they, essentially they went looking for different targets. So that's probably the closest yeah. So luckily, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that I, I pray to God, I never have to fire, fire my weapon in, in, uh, in self-defense. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, that's really given rise to one of the most unique services that you guys have over at us concealed carry, which is, you know, really your insurance program. Can, could you share a little bit about that? Cause I, I believe that if you are going to be a gun owner and a responsible one, this is one of the most valuable, uh, you know, resources that you could ever tap into out there. And one of, one of the most unique, it really has been amazing to, to see what you guys have done with this. Oh, certainly Mike. I'd, no, I'd love to talk about this. So, um, about three and a half years ago, we came out with a new membership benefit for USCCA members and, and we call it the self-defense shield. And essentially what this thing is, it's a, it's a multi-level a system of, of uh, protection that, that essentially protects, gives you a legal and financial backup plan for when you have to use your gun. And, you know, so imagine yourself, whether you're, you know, you have a concealed carry permit and you're out in a parking lot, or maybe you're even in your own house and someone breaks in and, and you're protecting your loved ones and you're forced to pull the trigger, right? Well, I don't care if you live in the most conservative county, in the most conservative state, there's a good chance there's going to be a criminal investigation and there's an even better chance that there's going to be a civil lawsuit against you for simply defending your loved ones. I mean, we all hear the news stories about, you know, some criminal breaks in and then sues the homeowner for, you know, for, for stabbing him, some crazy stuff like that. And so what the self-defense shield does, Mike, is it offers that. So we have three different levels at the platinum level, level it offers up to $1.1 million in insurance protection that will essentially pay for, the best legal defense, the best criminal defense lawyers, the best expert witnesses to get our members uh, out of jail and back home with their with their loved ones. I'm so excited about this because we just um, we just uh, worked this deal out with a national uh, bond bail bond company, and and so just last Saturday for the first time, this is a new benefit. We're always adding new benefits, but one of our members was obviously I can't say his name, but it was it was last Saturday. He was out in his yard and his neighbor, he walks out of his front door. His neighbor is getting beaten with a baseball bat by his brother-in-law. <laughs> wow. And, and so the USCCA member, you know, who's carrying a gun, walks up and says, hey, cut, knock, knock it off. And he pulls his gun and points it at the guy that's literally beating this man to death with a baseball bat. And, uh, you know, the guy stops with the bat. But then he calls the cop. Cops show up. And they uh, they take both the guy with the bat and the guy with the gun, the good guy, take him to the to the station. The guy with the bat gets released, and they keep our guy in jail because he had a gun. Wow! So our guy calls the USCCA on s- s- Saturday night at midnight, and, and we have twenty four seven response. And our person answers the phone, contacts the bail bond company, and we had him out of jail Sunday morning. Wow, that's awesome! It was, oh, it was fantastic! It was like this is the way it's supposed to work. It was so exciting. <laughs> That's awesome. And, you know, you guys do give a, which I think is a brilliant idea, and I actually have one, a card that you can keep in your wallet. Should you ever have to use your firearm, it tells you exactly what you should say word for word, you know, when the police show up, which, you know, unfortunately, most people don't know this and and no disrespect to, uh, you know, the policemen out there who are listening to this because I have a ton of respect for you guys and what you do. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, they're put in a position where, unfortunately, at this day and age, they're not necessarily on the side of the civilian these days. They're on the side of, you know, the the federal institutions that, uh, you know, uh, they call boss. And they're not out to to look out for the little guy, specifically when it comes to gun owners who are defending themselves and, and using their rights to do so. And so you guys have 
provided a card, you know, that provides, you know, the exact kind of words to say that way you don't overstep your bounds and, and somehow incriminate yourself in some way. And I wanted to see if you could maybe share, uh, you know, your thoughts around that. And, and I have my, I just pulled my copy out of my, my wallet here. It is, it is time for a new one. It has seen better days. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, Mike, that's, that, that's yet another thing that we do for our members. So, you know, people join the USCCA, they get all these benefits. Uh, they get a welcome package. They have a membership card. On the membership card, there's a spot for them to write their their, their attorney in. Uh, plus, there's our phone number, which is the number they you know this is the number they should call after they call the police and the ambulance, you know because we're the we're the people that are going to get 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 them get them out of jail get you know, get them the help that they need. Um, and then we also have the the shooting response card, which, as you mentioned, it actually has printed in, in pretty small print exactly what you should say to the, to the responding officers when they show up on the scene. And ultimately, essentially, we're going to say is like, look, I was attacked and I'm not going to say anything more until I'm, I'm represented uh, by my attorney. Now, here's something interesting, Mike, that I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but, but we have on staff uh, an active law enforcement officer. He's actually the editor of Concealed Carry Magazine, our ma- the magazine that we publish. He teaches that that your tip, you know, most typical police unions have negotiated with with the cities or the counties that they work for that they have that the, the, the police officers have seventy two hours after a police involved shooting before a statement must be made, and so the police officers who they're going to be pressing you for information the second they show up, you know, they know that you know they themselves get seventy two hours, so it's not uh, irrational for you to say, look, you know, I was attacked. I simply tried to just stop the threat. I want to wait for my attorney to show up because that's probably one of the most important things that needs to happen to keep the innocent people, the good guys like you and me, from being unmeritoriously prosecuted. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a phenomenal service that you guys are providing. And you're the, as far as I know, you're the only ones doing it. You know, this is really pioneering stuff uh, that matters and that is really good work. So thank you uh, in, to you and your staff for for all of these services and what you guys are doing. No um, yeah, it's been amazing. So. You know, we've got a couple of minutes left, Tim. What would you like to say uh, to everybody who is listening right now who, you know, we're going to obviously have a lot of people who who are gun owners and who are, you know, nodding in agreement with everything that we're saying. And then we're going to have, you know, other folks who might be on the complete opposite end of the spectrum or right in the middle on the fence somewhere. You know, what would you what would you like to say to them? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, what what this is all about, and and why they should really think hard about this type of thing. I would say this, and and this is going to everyone, whether a person is pro gun or for some reason anti gun. You know, ultimately, it it comes down to: Are you willing to make that decision to be the ultimate protector and and defender of your loved ones? Because Ultimately, the, the, your, your, the, your most important weapon that, that every, anyone has is between your ears. It's your brain. And it starts by making the decision that, yes, I will, take, I will accept that responsibility, whether, whether the, you know, the tools I use may be a gun, uh, maybe, maybe some other sort of training. I don't know. But, but, but that's the ultimate tool. The brain is the tool. And it starts with the decision. And then, and then, and, and then it becomes, OK, how am I going to implement this? Personally, I think the firearm is is a rather effective tool. It's it's an amazing equalizer. It's one of the few tools that that will give a a ninety year old one hundred pound grandma a legitimate chance at defeating a guy like me, who's I'm I'm a I'm a big guy. <laughs> and but that you know the the firearm that that tool will do that. In, in terms of of making that decision and going down that that process, it, it's a combination of. Of understanding, you know, how to be that sheepdog, how to live that that awareness lifestyle, you know, how how to live that preparedness lifestyle. You know, one of one of my favorite quotes, Mike, is is I love to expect the best in life, but I always prepare for the worst. And it's it's kind of a, you know, you, you kind of have to walk a fine line because if, if you if you live your life, ex, you know, preparing for the worst, there's going to be a tendency you're going to attract it to you. But as long as you temper it with expecting the best, then then you're going to be okay. So I guess uh, you know those those are probably some some of the best words of wisdoms I I can leave you guys with. Yeah, agreed, agreed. You know, it's so funny where you know, the the government tries to to sterilize the risks that society presents, and you know, recently the United Kingdom is trying to to pass a law that bans the use of knives, the ownership of knives for citizens. 
what are they going to cut their steak with, man? <laughs> no, the, literally, like, so that only only like steak knives and dinner knives would would be legal and lawful to own. They're literally taking it to that point. And let's say that their primary argument is, you know, well, well, someone was stabbed to death, and so if we take away the knives, that will save lives. And obviously. You know, if you've been a part of this conversation or topic in the past, you are very familiar with the the line that basically says, you know, guns don't kill people, people kill people. And it's the same thing with a knife. But, you know, could you imagine living in a society where the citizens are so neutered that they can't even carry a knife to defend themselves against a mugger or a robber or a carjacker or something else like that? And, and that's, the slippery, that's the, the slippery slope that this is really about. And that's why everyone really needs to get educated and informed on this topic. And hopefully, you know, it is, it is my, my hope and my wish, and I'm sure it is Tim's as well, that you will choose, uh, you know, to, to side with freedom and, uh, you know, with the second amendment. And even if you choose not to own a gun, that's obviously your personal choice. Uh, you will not side to take that right away from your fellow citizens who are in 99.9% of cases carrying that weapon in the one chance that they may have to defend themselves or you and your family, you know, should the need ever arise. So Tim, I want to thank you so much for your time today. And I want to let everybody know that you can find more about U.S. Concealed Carry here in the show notes. You know, any other resources, Tim, that you would, you would want or to, to share or website links that people should go visit? Not really. You can pretty much find everything at uscca.com. I'm sure the link will be somewhere around. Yeah, absolutely. We'll put it in the show notes. So, man, thanks so much for your time today and and for going over such an important and critical topic uh, with everyone. I hope you guys found some inspiration for this, some food for thought at a minimum. And, uh, you know, I would I would encourage you, encourage you to become a a civilian sheepdog and a protector for your family as a self-made man and uh, someone who cares about freedom. So once again, Tim, thanks so much. Really appreciate your time today. And it was great connecting again. My pleasure, Mike. Take care. 